All right, we'll just talk for a while tonight. With emphasis on self-questioning. I wonder if how much, or if at all, you have actually questioned deeply, persistently, with a good deal of earnestness and a good deal of, of passion in it, whether you question your life here on earth, question yourself, what you are all about, what, what's it all about, the whole thing, what's it all about? Because we don't seem to know. And every time we find an answer, it turns out to be no answer at all, no solution at all. So, can we ask ourselves tonight the question, do I really understand total life? Do I, do I or don't I? If I don't understand what it's all about, that puts me in a, a different position than I've ever had before totally different position because up until this point of saying that I don't understand I've lived by hundreds of assumptions of what I've called convictions of beliefs and up to this point I've never questioned them so now I'm going to start and I'm going to start by asking an, an enormously important, particular, specific question. I'm going to start, start with that. Question being, do I have a life of my own? Do I really have a life of my own? Do I have any idea of what's involved in the question what does it mean to have a life of my own it's very easy to say it to understand the depths of the question itself and can I start I could start if I could see enough by seeing something that I'd heard in religious phrases maybe heard it in church many times but never understood it couldn't apply it didn't know what it meant but I could see perhaps this when I have no life of my own then I have a life of my own what on earth does that mean Now you examine the way you live today. You just examine it from the time you got up this morning. And you see what you called your life today. What was it like? Now look. I mean, what was it really like? What was it like internally? What did you really think? How did you really feel? Have you ever been shocked at all by seeing the enormous conflict that you are in all day long? At the present, this is the life that is your own. Right? Agree? No, no argument there, is it? This is your life. This is my life. Petty lies. Getting thrills over pouncing on someone. Over gaining an advantage. Over making a lot of money. Over winning the lawsuit. 
over being complimented. And all the time, I'm very nervous about it and very tense. And hoping for someone or something to come to my rescue. Look, this is my actual life. I don't care how often I go to church or how many inspirational books I read, how religious I am, how active I am in the business world, how important I am in society's eyes. My personal inner life is a terror. So, the question being, do I have a life of my own? Well, I have a life. What kind is it? I can't really call it my own life. Not if I am dreadfully You want a life of your own? This is what you have. Hoping that someone will be pleased with you. This is the life you have. The question is, do I want a life of my own that I don't have to, listen, that I don't have to call my own? It has no self-proving in it. It is not seeking for someone to affirm. Listen to this. And those of you listening to this tape, listen to this. So that I'm not looking for someone to affirm my neurosis. So I'm not looking for a friend or a church or a study group or a husband or a wife who will call my sickness help. Because calling my sickness help leaves me sick. I don't know about you, but I don't want the kind of a life myself where I have to be afraid. Where I have to look to you for anything outside of normal necessities. When I get to the point where I don't need you except for normal necessities, I have a life of my own and I don't even have to think about it. It's because I think about it and try to prove it that I'm in the squirrel cage, that I have to keep running that I have to wonder whether I should phone you or shouldn't I phone you. Should I write the letter or shouldn't I write the letter? Should I get married or should I get divorced? Should I move to another city or should I stay here? Is this a life of help? I wonder if one of you in this room understands why we're here in this class. We're here to destroy what we have called our spiritual life, our so-called good life, our exciting life, our peaceful life, our secure life to blow it up because all we're blowing up is the artificial that which has made me afraid of death and afraid of life so this brings another self-questioning item you listen to this now Have you ever asked yourself, 
one what it means to actually change being the kind of a human being you are if you ever ask yourself what's involved what's involved in me changing being the kind of a human being that I am now that can't have anything to do with moving to another city or getting a wife or getting rid of a wife or winning the lawsuit or phoning someone to talk to when I'm lonely or demanding a raise it can't mean these things because this has been my life up until now and I'm still terrified it can't mean depending on my wife to talk to and to listen when I complain about how badly the boss treated me or how the world has treated me or the wife complaining to the husband and it sure can't mean having power over other people in any way because at one time in my life I had authority over others human level authority I was the sergeant in the army or I was boss of the factory or I was the parent of those children I was a school teacher I was the boss out in the field there good heavens I don't know the answer I, I, I've come to the end of trying to understand what it means to change being the kind of human being that I am I just don't know anymore and I read, I read all the books and went to all the talks and I wrote things down during the lecture and I tried to do some of the things I was told to do and I still get mad when you don't live up to my expectations I feel angry at you and I feel like telling you off but then if I tell you off that might make it worse and you might leave me so I don't know what to do I, I just don't have any answer at all do I so where am I I'm at the state where I have no answer at all if I'm getting intelligent I am I don't know the answer to feeling secure I just don't know it and everybody I ask gives me a different answer and I believe them for a day or a week or a month but you know you know there's something in me thank heaven there's something in me that refuses to accept that answer you gave me that that book gave me worse than that or better than that there is something in me that refuses to accept the answers of my own psychic system what on earth have I got myself into tell you this is scary isn't it I hope I hope it is I hope you're conscious of the fright of this state so 
so that you can begin to glimpse for the first time in your life what it means to die psychologically instead for heaven's sake of quoting it but to do it but to do it because beautifully beautifully you no longer have any other choice isn't that tremendous to no longer have a choice to no longer cry out what shall I do but to be so exhausted so sick of it that you can't even cry out anymore you don't have the strength to fight isn't that tremendous by remaining in this state this small beam of light that has been trying to break through our sickness and our neurosis and our lies and our stubbornness the light breaks through for the first time and the light is a feeling it's a sensing totally unlike anything you've ever sensed before and you don't think about it at all you don't think about it you know why you don't think about it anymore? Because thought, right thought, has done its proper work. And it has come to an end because you've seen the fallacy of trying to think, imagine your way out. You see that any labels you have put on yourself must go. And when all label goes, all when all labels go, who are you? You tell me. When all your labels go, all your imaginations about yourself go, who are you? You won't be able to say, will you? Because if you say it, you've added the label. So the free state, the state that is not of my neurosis, my former sickness, is a state that is free of thinking about. A state where all hope has been abandoned. Because this hope is simply another disguised false self in there that says, when. When. When I get this. When I get rid of that. Then I'll know who I am. Ah, that's it. Then I'll know. When I get elected, then I'll know. You won't. So we have another question, a third main question. <clears throat> Without realizing that I'm doing it, do I assume that I understand more about what we're studying than I actually understand? And I'll say that in another way. Does my imagination lead me to believe, to falsely reason that I understand more than I actually do? Oh, this is very simple to prove if you're doing this, if you're real honest. Again, what is your internal day like? Now you tell me. <clears throat> That could be a clue as to whether we're making false assumptions, thinking that we understand more than we actually do, and I'll give you a specific example. When I really understand something, when I really understand what love is, when I understand what conscience is, when I understand what understanding is, when I see, then, then, this understanding can use the word love. This 
understanding can use the word understanding always because to use a figure of speech the higher can descend and use the lower properly that is consciousness insight can use words because the understanding is not identifying with the words the understanding is not identifying with the words that is when a free mind says i love i love the i is not personal is it that's the same thing that's the same when you say if you have a free mind a free psychic system and you say i love that is the same as saying god loves right same thing exactly the same thing. if i say i love i understand using it as a self-label for me i love all mankind i love voters self-deception because i've referred it back to a pseudo self which i want to keep alive by using the word and thinking that the word is the state which it is not very simple isn't it you think you're understanding this not talking to you personally in this audience you don't understand what i'm talking about that we're going into when you say the word love you say the word love now you say it is that word love that came from your mouth your state or can you say i love and feel hateful can you say i understand people i have a great grasp of human nature can you say that and lie because your inner state is confused about both yourself and everyone else can I see the word is not the state and can I have the courage to stop using words as if they describe me which will shock the life out of you shock false life out of you or me or am i going to continue to blithely toss out sermons and advice and counsel to both other people and to myself And never know never know that I am a divided human being what would happen what do you suppose would happen if you stopped using words such as I love I understand I care I am considerate of other people I understand myself I understand God what do you suppose would happen if you cut out the word the phrase the verbal level which is the mental level what do you suppose would happen if you eliminated it altogether I will tell you you would cease to exist thank him because then you would exist without effort then when i exist in this new way i've changed this inner being i can use all the words i want i can use the word love understanding 
there is no one there to refer it back to. Which is oneness with God. To paraphrase a little bit, to be absent from me is to be present with God, with truth. Finally, real encouraging. Regardless of how any of us in this room or any of you listening to this tape have lived in the last week internally, and you know how bad it's been, don't you? You know how afraid you are, don't you? You're getting a little more honest about that, aren't you? Hmm? Regardless of how bad it has been, I'm going to tell you something. God, truth, reality exists. Maybe you didn't know before tonight that God really exists. I'm telling you. Truth, capital T, exists. Not as a word to toss around, but as a fact. We are going to go beyond the word, and guess what? You, me, we're going to go beyond the word to be the fact. This is possible. I know it's possible. I'm telling you it's possible. So regardless of your week, your past week, regardless of the tricky little human being which you now are and you are and suffer from that can be changed by truth itself and we'll do it you're told uh, yes go ahead let me ask you a question yes you happen to be fortunate enough to even see that state and still can't stay in that state there is another battle yes that begins or continues at that point. The battle is endless. This is why we we have to be so alert, why we have to shock ourselves, prod ourselves, refuse to be lazy, refuse to think that just sitting down and reading the book is going to do something for me. It can get me the necessary knowledge, yes. And that's quite essential. Because that's my guideline on the mental level. I have to have right ideas, right thoughts. If I don't have those, I can't go on from there. And I'll distort everything so I can get the knowledge. Do I know what it means to go beyond knowledge? That is the hard question. That's what I have to ask myself every minute. And if I have to defend what I call my knowledge, there's something wrong. That means I have a doctrine. That means I have a belief. That, I, that means I have a set of attitudes. And woe unto you if you cross me. Right? Do you, do you really think truth needs defense? You're defending your religious doctrine, calling it truth? You're deceiving yourself, and you have no conscience. Do you know what you're doing to everybody you meet? When you call your religious doctrines, your religious beliefs, the road to God? <coughs> well, I could get stronger, but I won't tonight. You might not be able to take it. I'll just repeat. heaven's sake man woman what are you doing to yourself that you're passing on to your children to that husband you claim to love to that wife you claim to love 
to those other people you claim to like. Now this is the hard part. Because you know, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to be lost and confused and cry out for answers knowing, knowing that I, I can't answer them myself. And I'll have to get emotional about it. And I'll have to stay there, and I'll have to struggle and fight. And I'm going to have to say, God, help me. I'm not going to lie anymore. If it puts an end to me, I'm not going to lie anymore. And that, that honesty is what puts an end to me. Now I don't suffer anymore. No, I'm not in the whirlpool anymore. No, I'm not tense and nervous and afraid of losing, losing anything anymore. I've lost it. Aren't you glad that there's a way out? What would you do if you didn't know that there's a way out? Wouldn't your life be a desperation? Wouldn't it be terrible to have to cram your mind with a schedule? Oh boy, tomorrow night we're going to the movie. I hear it's a big hit. Everybody's going to it. We're going to the movie. We're going to dinner first. Then we'll go to the movie. Then when we get home, we'll be tired, and so we go to bed. So I, good, so bed is good too, sleeping is good. It'll keep me from facing. And when I get up, I'll go to work. Thank heaven that I, I have that hateful office work. At least it keeps me from thinking. Nipping on you while eating, something like that. You're gonna be very alert and very awake. <coughs> So the next time you do this, you don't automatically, mechanically, and emotionally say, oh, know what I mean, right? Because you will do this. You, you've been doing it all your life. Next time you drop something, a cup, water, whatever, you be very alert. It falls, no question about that. You drop it, all right? You don't go into wasted energy, wasted thought. No wasted reaction at all. None. You drop the glass, right? You pick the glass up and you put it down. You know what? That's going to make you less and less drop that glass because you're going to be able to be where you are at the moment. Your attention, your attention is going to be where you are at the moment so that you're paying attention to what you're supposed to be doing at the moment. This is why we get traffic tickets, because we're not paying attention to what we're supposed to be doing at the moment. But every time this happens, every time we fall victim to our own inattention, use it, grab it, take it as a lesson, and break the mechanicalness of it right now. You get angry at someone, you get upset at yourself, don't you dare keep that going. You drop it right now. And you drop it by being attentive to it right now. So that we're not wasting all this psychic energy, all this strength that we have. So that we're living intelligently instead of as slaves to our own lack of understanding about how we really work inwardly. You can do this all by yourself. Even if you feel that your life is dominated by another person, even if you feel that you don't understand these things you hear here, even if you feel that you, you'll never grasp them, 
even if you're totally confused, you can work right now. Nobody, no one can take this, this here away from you. No one. <coughs> Not even your own sickness can take it away from you. How's that for encouragement? Not even my own neurosis, your own neurosis, can prevent me from breaking out. This is what is known as authentic encouragement because it's based on truth, on fact. I'm not saying anything to arouse emotion. When I tell you something that is true, right feeling goes with it. This is why you feel good, rightly good, rightly feel good when you hear some of these things, when you hear certain facts about yourself, that you are capable of being attentive to what you're doing at the moment. It makes you feel good because something in you senses that you have this somewhere hidden inside you. If you go away from this, if you depart from this, you will depart sad. Those of you who have been here a number of times, if you ever go away from this, either physically, or mentally, or any other way, you will depart sad. Because there's something in you that senses the rightness of this. And you know you're never going to find the way out anywhere else. But in the truth itself. Like the rich young ruler, remember in the New Testament? He went away sad. So the answer is very simple. Don't go away from truth. Don't you let anyone con you. Because the devil is a con man. The greatest con man on earth. And he'll try to take these things away from you. He'll try to tell you, some of you, perhaps, he'll try to tell you that this is, this is on a very high moral plane. This is good stuff. It's very moral. That's not the point at all. The point is, whether this truth that you have heard in this class tonight and other times, is going to become yours. So that you experience the only real miracle there is in life, which is the death of everything false and the life of everything real. So that you can walk down the street of this city or in Texas or Michigan or Florida or some foreign country. You can walk right down in that busy, noisy street and be one with yourself.
one way to state the human problem is to say that our internal psychic world moves too fast, moves too impulsively, it moves recklessly, it moves without consciousness, it rolls forward, and since we are this world, we roll forward without being aware of what is going on inside our own self as it relates to ourself and it relate, as it relates to the outer world. So as often as possible, we're going to remind ourselves from now on to slow down. Slow down what? Slow down the way we think, the way we feel, the way we talk, the way we respond to life. Slow down mechanical decisions. Gradually come to a grinding halt so that we're not reacting to life with ordinary rushing thought, which can't cure anything but can only make it worse because that level cannot correct anything on that level. A mad world, whether it's out there or inside you or me, that mad world can't correct the mad world out there or inside. So going quite slowly this morning, I'm even going to talk a little bit slow, we're going to take up again something that we touched on fairly briefly last night, which is the idea of using words. How do words relate to what our life is like, to what we're trying to do here? We toss out words without even hearing what we say half the time, therefore not catching the mechanicalness, the impulsiveness, the self-deception, and the destruction in it. So let's take one word, which we use quite often here, and see, see what this one word is all about. <clears throat> take the word negativity, to be negative. You understand what it means to be negative, do you not? And those of you listening to this tape, it simply means to be in a wrong state, a bad state, a self-destructive state to be jealous, to want power over someone, to be afraid of someone, to want to try to prove myself, this is a negative state, and on and on. So can I see everything possible about a negative state? What does it mean to be negative? Think with me on this, will you? You ask yourself at the same time I'm talking to you, what does it mean to be negative? For one thing, it means I'm still living in the delusion that I exist as a labeled self. I take a myth as reality. I take fiction as fact. I think that this feeling I have of being jealous is me. I am jealous. When I say I am jealous, I am negative, am I not? And I create the feeling, the feeling, and the thought of me, which is a falsehood. Therefore, to be negative means to live in the delusion that I exist as a certain type <coughs> of labeled person, which I do not at all. That's what the basis of negativity is. All right, all right. To be negative means I'm thinking and feeling instead of understanding, instead of seeing. Instead of seeing what? Instead of seeing that in truth, in reality, in the kingdom of heaven, I am free from all negativity, that I don't, I don't have to be jealous. If I'm not there, which I am not in reality, how can I be jealous of you? How can I be 
How can I be angry at you? I noticed your faces this morning and last night, those of you here, and I noticed how depressed some of you are. Are you aware of sitting here with a defeated, depressed look on your face? How about depression as a negative state? What can we, to be more specific, what can we learn about being depressed? Let me see the hands of those of you who get depressed, despondent. Yeah. Many hands went up, and those of you listening to this tape are also depressed. Whether you are aware of it or not, you might cover it up in various ways, but you can't really hide it from yourself, can you? What is depression? Many things. First of all, this is sort of repetition and very good to understand. Depression is pure vanity. When you're depressed, you're an egotist. What is an egotist? An egotist is someone who lives by the word, by the word, I, me, self. My interests, my security, my career, I can catch myself responding with strain, with unnaturalness. And if I've listened very carefully in these classes, I can catch the possibility, at the first it's only a possibility, of me, of me, my real me, my real self, my real I, of not having a response at all to what I call the exterior situation, which I assume threatens me in some way. Then, instead of being in the flooding river, caught in it, carried away by it, I'm standing on the bank observing the rushing river. No longer being part of it. Therefore, no longer fighting and swimming to get out of it. I'm out of it altogether, but I still can see it there. I'm safe on the bank. I'm safe on the bank because I don't want anything that is involved with the river, including its ultimate destination. Look what happens. You'll see. you understand. I know. I jump into the river in a frail boat, a frail boat called career, success, and so on, hoping that the river, I know it's, uh, it's, it's raging, I know that, but my desperation to be carried to the destination called success, called love, called God, makes me foolishly jump into the river and hope that it'll take me to my destination. Now I'm in the fight. Fighting with the man in the next boat too, right? And hoping that it'll carry me down to where where I think I think I'll have it made. And very often if I succeed in getting the love or the money. I'll put a label on it and call it having it made and still be an animal. Fighting everyone else in the river. Now, what part of me likes the fight likes the conflict with you and with the world that likes to be engaged in ego competition. What part of me? Well, 99 and 9 tenths part of me likes to fight. And I don't know how many times we've explained why I want to stay in the raging river and fight. But I'll repeat it. The reason I prefer to fight is because I sense, dimly sense, 
that if I fight in a different way, that is to get out of the river of competition, of social insanity, if I fight to get out of it and stand on the bank, I won't know who I am. I won't be able to say I've got a real good career going and in three years, man, I'll have it made. I won't be able to say that. Or I'll say, I'll find God. If I read enough religious books and go to enough religious meetings, I'll find God. So I sense that even if, if I give up the verbalization, if I come to an end of seeking God, of success, then what am I going to do with my life? Right? What on earth will I do with myself? This is part of the process, if you get this far, of slowing down your internal world to the point where you can begin to see your terror of giving up falsehood. I'll repeat. It is necessary to come to the point of seeing your fear of giving up falsehood, of giving up worldly aims which you think or I think are going to tell me who I am. I'm a success or I'm a failure. Either one is just as good as another. Look, look how we always come back in these talks, in these meetings. And I'll tell you, don't you ever think this is repetitious? You'd better begin to see the necessity for you to come to this point. Or your despair, your despair is overwhelming. Your despair is overwhelming and you cease to do anything about it. When you cease, when you, when you still do something about your frantic feelings, when you continue to do something about it, you keep it going, right? All you do is change directions in your neurosis, which keeps it going. Now, what's the alternative? The alternative is to get every ounce of courage I have, get it together based on knowledge partly, but based mostly on a willingness to exchange what I know for something I don't know. Don't you ever assume that you know what it is like to stand on the bank and look at the raging river because you don't know. If you knew you would be on the bank instead of in the river, but you would not be thinking about it. You would be the bank itself. You would be the bank itself. When you feel threatened, when you feel that your identity is in danger from the truth, from God, can you simply understand the whole process and resist not what you call evil so that the fear of dying, so that the fear of dying is seen by you as a false move in itself. I'll repeat. Can you see, can you see that the terror of being no one, of not having these exciting aims and goals, that the fear itself is a hoax played on you by your own misunderstanding and deluded mind. 
if I, I, if I can glimpse this, then, and I'll use the word deliberately this time, if I can see this, then it becomes easier, not easy, but easier for me, and I'll use two words you've heard many times, it becomes easier for me to let go. To let go means to drop everything of the river, of the raging river, of the flooding river, including, and get this, including my desperate cry, how can I get out of the river? How can I get out of this mess? Do you know who's screaming for God to save him, to save her? A mechanical force. Not you at all. Who is this desperate person who wants to be saved from the river? Who is this... this this frantic individual who wants God or Christ to save him. Try to understand what I say, what I'm going to say next. Put it all together, what we're talking about. When a guilty scream, a sinner screams out, God save me, that guilty sinner needs to be saved from his own egotism, his own vanity. And if he can do that, he will never again cry out for God or Christ to save him, at which point he will be saved. Do you understand this? Yes? No? All right, I'll ask you again. Let's change it a little bit. When you have a problem in everyday life, We'll bring it down to everyday life. When you have a problem in everyday life, in a human relationship, for example, should I leave this person or should I go toward him? How am I going, how am I going to handle my relatives? What should I do about my wife, my alcoholic husband or my neurotic wife? What am I going to do about it? How can I handle it? Now you listen very carefully to what I'm going to say next. Who has the problem? Who has the problem? Why do you why do you ask how am I, how am I going to solve this problem? Why don't you find out who is asking the question? Dissolve that. Then see whether there's a problem anymore. There will not be a problem at all. I am the problem. And out of this false sense of self comes hundreds of perplexities, of frantic seeking of wrong questions. Out of this single falsehood, right, arises thousands of false questions, of frantic running around to find answers and look look you'll agree with me on this if you're real honest you haven't found the answers have you have you and somehow you're terrified that you never will and i will tell you you never will well, i'll put it this way again the only thing we can do, the only thing, this is our salvation, real salvation. The one thing we can do is to understand that the person who asked the question, who is desperate and nervous, that is the problem. Oh. But it isn't easy 
to slow down my whole inner world to the point where I can see this and put an end to the whole mess all at once. Which means I don't have to get rid of one little exterior difficulty at a time, but by clearing the inner, the outer becomes just as clear. Because I've ceased, I have ceased to create the problem in the first place. And how did I cease to do it? To do it by not being me anymore. By not trying to solve the problem on the level of ordinary logic, which is not logic at all. By seeing, glimpsing at the start that there is a state which is above my seeking, my thought, my ideas, my desires, my desperation, then having the courage, listen, listen to this, then having the courage to simply drop being desperate. Now you try it and see if you can do it. Can you drop being desperate? No. No. Because that will mean the end of you. Right? Right? See? Look, look what's going to happen. Never again, if you find this state, never again will you ever be able to feel the sick, neurotic pleasure of screaming persecution. Never again would you or me ever be able to cry and feel sorry for myself. Are you willing to drop the one in order to have the other? Or are you too terrified at giving up your pettiness, your resentment, your great plans for being somebody in this world and showing them. Look, you and I have to make a decision as to which we want. And we have to make that decision with great passion, with a, with, with a great aim of plunging into it, heaven help us, but making the decision that I'm never going back to the old ways again. And this is where this group comes in. We're helping each other have the courage, building the courage to turn our backs on everything that has given us false rewards up till now. Are you, oh, I better, I better say this. Are you willing to give up hating someone? Oh, you don't hate anyone. Oh, yes, you do. And you know it. Now, now I can go on to the question again. Are you willing to give up the thrill, the ego thrill, the sick, neurotic, psychopathic thrill of hatred? If so, you have given yourself an opportunity. If not, well, well, you'll have to live with yourself. Maybe I better ask that too. Uh, those of you listening to this tape included, will you please answer the following question? What is it like living with me? What's it like living with yourself? Pretty awful, isn't it? Here, here in this group, we can change it.
It can actually be done. We can do it. All right. Now, because you have no choice in the matter, you can protest and scream and holler and be as frightened as you are. That's all right. This is what you are. You have no choice. I don't tell you don't don't be afraid. You are afraid. That's your state. <clears throat> we are saying in this class, work with what you are, as you are, without evading it, without refusing to see all these negative thoughts that you have. Seeing, for example, petty pleasures over getting something for nothing on any level. You get a thrill out of winning a contest or whatever, you, you find out. You are not conscious, you are not conscious of how scared you really are. So can you work on that? It's quite a necessary step. Because if you don't see it, then you will lie to yourself and say, I'm not scared. After all, I'm a Christian. Or I'm a child of God. Or I have plenty of distractions to keep me from being scared. And you don't even say, when you say distractions, you're admitting that you're scared. Shall we all, shall we all agree to plunge right into the middle of this horrible mess called myself, right into the middle of it, and not be ashamed not be afraid and that means another way now but do it <coughs> there comes a point in instruction like you're getting here this morning there comes a point where words words descriptions ideas can go no further and several times during this talk, I have come to this point, which means that something else other than words, yours or mine, have to take over, something that is higher than thought, than description. This is our, is our opportunity to drop thought and in its place to see, to understand. It is very, and I'll put this in quote words, it is very, the word difficult, I'll put in quote words, it is very difficult, in fact it is impossible to convey truth through words, through a talk. It's impossible. We can only go so far, right? You understand that? And where my words leave off and your words, which is thinking, leads off, le leaves off, Something else can take its place. This, this is really what we're trying to do in this group. So I can see the difference between thinking about a fact, thinking about it, and seeing it. Seeing it. One final word before we stop. I'll give you a word and you think about it long and hard and give it a higher definition, a higher definition. And that's the word self-responsibility. Look, I have to do it. You have to do it. In this class, we can get all the help we want from each other and that is just fine. But finally, since I live with myself 24 hours of the day, 
I have to take the responsibility for turning, for replacing, for replacing words with seeing, with understanding. Ask yourself, where can I take more responsibility for my own inner development? Where can I take a greater responsibility for it? Which means every time you do take a responsibility, you'll receive a minor jolt. Someone mentioned yesterday that they were talking with someone and the other person wanted this individual to agree. So this individual said she had a hard time refusing to nod in agreement because she knew the other person wanted him, her to agree with him. Can you give yourself a minor joke by taking the responsibility of refusing to agree with sickness? Refusing to go along with neurosis because you want something from the other person. Stop wanting it and see how easy life becomes. <clears throat> Then, as we said last night, you will live your own life. You will have your own life. And it will be an effortless life. And something which thought and imagination can't see, can't see, but which you can be. Would you like to discuss something? Ask questions? I get a feeling when I'm trying to put the work, uh, trying to work with the work, I get a feeling that I'm just doing it from imitation all the time. And it seems to have been my life, you know, religion from religion. You know, you do this and you get, you'll get this, you know. Right. Yes, that's what organized religion is, simply one man imitating another. You can see it in a, a large mass meeting, can't you? The leader says, raise your right hand and pray. Everybody raise the right hand and pray. Imitation. Thinking, thinking that you're doing something from yourself. Only God, truth, can do something from himself. The rest is sham. The rest is me. Which does not discount individuality on the everyday level. You like peach pie, your neighbor likes apple pie, individual choice. Where's the problem? No problem. So imitation does indeed become a word to watch, to see where it exists in me. And I have seen a good deal of imitation in this group, in some of the talks I hear up here. Unconscious imitation. and borrowing. You're not talking from yourself. It's, this is not a criticism. This is a stage we have to go through. No one is criticized or condemned. But I can watch myself. I can watch myself talking. And right now, I'm deliberately turning my attention back now because this is my choice for now. I'm hearing myself talk. My attention is back on myself, also out there too. If I can pay attention to myself while I'm giving a talk or asking a question, I can begin to detect imitation, a compulsive need to talk. Yes. All right, I will answer that by asking you an old, favorite, familiar question. How much can you take from someone who either is trying to help you or is trying to destroy you by destroying himself, of course, who is trying to wake you up in some way with right or wrong motives how much can you take from that person and get hurt and get mad and get resentful and come back? That is my question to you. 
That's how you can begin to see what you really like. How much can you take? It's so simple. Can you get insulted at this meeting and come back for more insults? How much can you take? Or you hear something and the danger sign, danger, this is a danger to your individuality, quote marks, to your separate sense of self. Danger, hide. You can hide magnificently sometimes. You can hide by preaching sermons about not hiding. Can I stand in fear and trembling before anything that happens to me out in that world? Do I, I get fired or I lose my money or, or you catch me behaving badly when I'm off guard? Ooh, ooh, that's especially valuable, by the way. Isn't that shocking to be caught out of a role? Isn't that awful? Huh? You're all smiling. I heard a voice. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that good? Because it's so humiliating. This is what we're after. <clears throat> and I come right back. You know what I say? Among other many other things, depending on your own individual work. Okay. You caught me, what? You caught me smoking a cigarette and I paraded around as a non-smoker and didn't talk too close to you lest you smell my breath in class. Yeah, you get your own example. You caught me smoking and I throw it out quick and you saw my hand anyway. I go home. I work on that. Now very seriously. I refuse absolutely and positively to be carried away by the sense of shame of being caught out of my role. I am not going to go into that and let it carry me over and say, oh, I have to face him tomorrow. I'm going to see something tremendous. I wish I could tell you, but I can't. That at the moment, I feel this humiliation, this shame. I can break the mechanical feeling, the mechanical reaction. I can drop it and be new right now. Which means I'm going to have to drop the false feeling of life I get out of being humiliated. They caught me. They caught me. That's the important. They caught me. Do you understand? Will you give yourself this enormous jolt of dropping your shame right now? See it and refuse to go along with it because it is giving you a false feeling of individuality. I'm a shame, I'm a shameful person. You, you are an egotist when you say that. You're not being humble. You're saying you're somebody and you're not. You're nobody, and neither am I, which is our liberty. Yes? You said how good it would feel if we were ever told by a friend what they really thought of us, and I had that happen to me. We told this couple that we wouldn't play bridge with them anymore. It pushed me into a corner until finally I explained that I just didn't care to play bridge anymore, and et cetera. <clears throat> Well, after she thought about it for a few days, she told me what she thought of it. Enumerated in detail, everything. Okay. And afterwards, yes, at that moment, the shock is so great because this, well, it was with me because she was the only woman friend I had. And then you work on it because you know it has to be there. They can't see things that aren't there. And I had to work doubly hard because I had to pass their house every time I went grocery shopping. And a lot of times they were out in the yard. So then I had to work right. on the fear of right. not turning away. And in time, I saw that whenever she recognized my car, she made a dash into the house. <laughs> she really created a problem for herself. Well, you know that she isn't working, so nothing counts from that but end. It really, because this... They lived there for five years, and I had to really, you know, 
Okay, fine. That brings up a, a good question. How many of you in this room, forget everybody else in this room for the moment to keep it a clearer picture. How many of you in this room have either nice friends or nice relatives? May I see your hands? Only one person has nice friends and nice, nice relatives. Uh -huh. I don't think I'll go any <laughs> Wait a minute, one at a time. Al? Uh, I can see where this nice relative business is, is very good as long as they're, uh, what, 150 miles away. <laughs> so, but as long, as long as there's no contact. Yes. They're very nice. Okay. Kathy? Uh, it brings up, what is the definition of a friend? Would you like to define it from the work point of view? Sure. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. So in that regard, we're all very good friends here because as much as we're able to do so, we're trying to help ourselves and the other person, which is not a separate action, is it? Is it? It's not a separate action. I help me, I help you. Really, really help me. Not falsehood, but really help me. I can't but help, help but help you if you want it. Yes. Sure, sure, because you used it. Goodbye, friends. Yeah, we don't stay around long. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, there's always that remnant. And that remnant has to go to the remnant. Well, maybe he or she's not such a bad, bad fellow, bad gal after all. They haven't found the truth. They are bad from the viewpoint of reality. 